Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Transfigured. I'm here with Jordan Daniel Wood. He is a author and theologian. He has written a book on Maximus the Confessor uh, called the what? Oh, I'm sorry. I immediately blanking on the title. The <laughs> That's okay. Cosmi the the what, whole mystery of Christ. The whole the mystery whole mystery. Of Christ, of, yeah. The whole mystery of Christ. Yeah. And it's a it's a really good book about both kind of. It's, I mean, in some sense, it's a historical theology book, I guess. But I also feel like it's sort of transcending that genre a little bit and that you mean to be a little bit more, I don't know, perennially relevant than just here's what some guy long ago used to think and teach. Yeah, exactly. I think at the beginning, I don't remember now if it's in the preface or not, but I, I try to sort of align myself with the method, if you were loosely, you know, loosely uh, stated of Hans Urth von Balthasar, that Swiss Catholic theologian who also wrote a book, a, fa a fairly well-known book on Maximus. But, you know, a lot of people sort of criticize, you know, so saying you're doing a work of historical theology is sort of already guaranteeing you're going to get in trouble from two sides. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to be a, you know, a rigorous enough historian on the one hand and getting into all the social, cultural artifacts, the liturgical context, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, enough for that crowd and then you will also not be you'll be too historical and be too moored to say particular controversies in this or that time period for you know just like a systematic or a straightforward christology or something like that so you know i, I follow those like balthazar who kind of basically accept that that almost inevitable uh you know uh dual front uh battle that continues and just say you know i'm Simply put, I've found Maximus among the most stimulating thinkers from Christian tradition for thinking myself about, you know, Christology mm -hmm. or creation or, or whatever it is. And so it is I want to be fair to him. I don't want to be you know, I don't want to simply override everything he says with or impose what, you know, what, what he says with my own thoughts or something. At the same time, I don't want to pretend like I'm just some kind of objective historian simply reporting to you what Maximus said. I have found him stimulating, which means, you know, that which is stimulated is right here and now and in our time, in our place with our concerns and our questions. So, yeah, I yeah. feel like that's a that's a very good way of putting it. One of the, the things I do on my channel is I have a church fathers series where me and my friend Hank are just sort of going through the early church fathers. We're on Athanasius right now. Okay. And, and I, I try, I think that that is sort of the right balance that it, history is important. Setting them in their context is important. Letting them speak for themselves without mm -hmm. trying to impose kind of too modern of categories or thinking on them, but I'm not just doing it as a work of history either. I'm doing it because I think that there is something refreshing um and vital that they still have to say and teach too so. yeah ex exactly it's i think at one point i used the kind of well and i think this is apt for like you you know the conversations and the people with the interlocutors you have on the internet and stuff where it's like a conversation you know you don't and just mm -hmm. because it, it's the difference is it's trans temporal we're talking about conversational partners in the past and obviously there's some limitations built in but just like you said you know it's like look I want to be a good conversation partner. So I need to hear what they actually say. I don't need to, I can't cut them off or impose or whatever. I want to, I want to try to give them a voice the best we can. That's all the historical work, giving mm -hmm. them a voice, let, letting, like you said, letting them speak for themselves. And then, and then, but this is a dialogue after all. It's not just, it's, I'm not just an empty conduit through which they, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, right. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a megaphone for them and they're not a megaphone for me. We're, we're actually, there's something like a dialogue with yes qualifications, but yeah. And I think that's, um, you know, I read when I was sometime, this was like over a decade ago, I read the essay by Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, the use uh, and abuse of history for life. It's in his collection, The Untimely Meditations. And actually, I have to say, you know, for all my ups and downs with Nietzsche, that essay was really impressive to me, mainly at its negative point, which was just, which is mostly usually what he's doing, um, which is just, look, you can be an antiquarian. There are antiquarians who just like old things and want to study them, and there's no other reason for it. But none of that's yet for life. And so there still remains the question of why I care about all that at all right now, right here and now. Mm -hmm. And so that's just another another way of putting it. And that, that's always somewhat stuck with me, you know.
So. Nietzsche is one of those people who you kind of wish you didn't like as much as you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. He, he, he's hard to do away with. And well, I mean, he was a, a classics, a classicist, exactly. really. That was sort of his core uh, identity and scholarly pursuit for a long time. Yes, so. yes. Yep. So uh, anyway, so he's he's stuck with me. And so anyway, yeah, this book has, hope you, you, you know, I think you rightly sense there is that kind of, as it were, dynamism in it. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be careful with the, with Maximus and his historical context and what he's saying and his language and all that stuff. But I'm also, yeah, I'm sort of trying to push the bounds. I'm not simply trying to give a report. I, I think there's something to say, you know, for now and perennially relevant, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, so before we go into Maximus or the book in particular, do you want to tell me a little bit about yourself, sort of what's your own kind of spiritual and theological background and how did you get interested in these things? Yeah, so I grew up, um, so my father was raised in the um, uh, non-instrumental churches of Christ. Um, his his mother came from Tennessee, so there was a sort of, um, that's in a, a broader movement, if I put it that way, of called the Restoration Movement, or sometimes called the Stone Campbell Movement. That's the Disciples of Christ, Christian Churches, Churches of Christ. Um, and what of does course, um, non-instrumental mean? So there, <laughs> here we go. We're getting to the Restoration History Movement. Uh, no, it's um, basically there was a certain, mo mainly southern, uh, the, the sw southern swath of this of this movement. Uh, there's a certain amount of churches that uh, there. There's debate about this, but basically, they the, what it means is that they don't use instruments in worship. Mm, yeah. Okay. So there's no there's no piano in the church. There's no organ, of course. No one's playing guitar or anything. And, and you know, there's both. There's a sort of social and theological side to that. And I don't, I don't get too far into that. But basically, the social side was, you know, this movement is very low church. So so there's a sense in which having an organ in a church is for the elite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're, they're sort of refined sensibilities and so forth. Like, and, so, and also organs are literally expensive. So they're exactly. And they're literally expensive. And a lot of these churches are just poor rural, you know, uh, you know pre-civil war era churches. And so, yeah, they're just like, we don't, we don't do that. We're taking care of our, own. so there is a real social side to it that actually I think makes some sense. Uh, it helps at least explain it. But then of course, later you get the kind of, you know, um, ad hoc theological justifications. I don't want to just say this is like a pragmatic thing or a, or even <laughs> a social statement, but this is actually the way it needs to be. Yeah. And so there's arguments about, you know, in the Bible, like there's all these really kind of ridiculous arguments about, you know, uh, the Bible doesn't allow instruments. And then people say, Oh, what about all these instruments being used? And, you know, <laughs> what about David's like, liar? Exactly. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden it's like, well, I mean, was that technically worship or was that something, you know, and it's like, okay. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it gets kind of ridiculous, but um, anyway, so yeah, my, my, so my dad comes from that background. Um, and, and then um, my mom was raised loosely in a kind of Lutheran affiliated church. Uh, tradition but her her there were a lot of different issues going on there so i was raised in the christian church part of the restoration movement or the stone campbell movement which was the, so it gets weird you know it was not the instrument not instrumental people there's like this great divide and you know antagonism there etc cetera, etc cetera. uh but it, anyway it's a pretty much in in short it's a very decentralized non-hierarchical low church biblic biblicist if i can say it that way like yeah, very much yeah. just the bible the preacher might also be the one who leads the hymns uh and you know it's so i ended up in fact going to so i was raised in that tradition what's what's difficult about that sort of thing is that by its nature it's decentralized so it's hard to categorize i mean it really is church to church there's some loose things that they believe that bind them together. But so you, you'll go to a church. Sometimes you could go even to this day, you can go to one of those churches. And you might have have no idea that it's a part of something called a Stone Campbell movement. The restoration. Right. It's not. It basically just looks like a non-denominational, somewhat evangelical church. Mm -hmm. um, that's more and more common. And then. Uh, but then you can go to other ones that almost feel like a Baptist church or something, you know? Yeah. Um, and some are almost even on like the mainline Protestant end of things. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that, and really historically the disciples of Christ, those churches, a part of that move, that sliver of part, part of that tradition are, are basically mainline. Um, so, so it's, it's quite a spectrum, but nevertheless, you know, so, uh, so I got like, you know, 
I think injections of what I would now call something like a fundamentalist approach to scripture. And yet there were weird exceptions here and there. And, and then you get some evangelical stuff you get. Uh, by the time I got to Bible, I went to the Bi a Bible college in that uh, tradition, planning on becoming some sort of minister or a preacher in that tradition, like some of my family had. Uh, and, um, you know, by the time I got there, there was like a lot of influence from like popular reformed theology going on and the young uh, restless and reformed uh, exactly influence creep yeah, yeah yeah there was a exactly there was a whole yeah you know you get and this was back in the what i don't even remember 2005 to 2009 i was john piper and tim keller and, exactly uh, and, and driscoll crowd, yeah. and yeah 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 mm -hmm. and so um and so there was like a swath doing that. But then meanwhile, there's like people over on the side reading like N.T. writes Jesus and the victory of God. And they're like getting corrupted. And <laughs> it's fun, funny to consider that, you know, corrupted. Yeah. But, they're um, having new perspectives on Paul. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Forbid, yeah. What is all this yeah. new stuff? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so that's kind of the like. So while I was at Bible college, sort of the way the story goes, uh, um, you know, as one does when you start, um, you know, what, what this tradition was good at if you were going to get serious in it was putting, you know, getting you to know the text very well. So you're learning Hebrew, you're learning Greek at, at 18 years old. If you go to Bible college, you get up at 7 AM, four days a week, you're doing Greek. Um, you know, so you, you know, the text very, very well. There's entire classes just devoted to like one book of the new Testament and so on. Obviously most of the time with a very specific angle, very specific slant, et cetera, but you are getting to know the text itself really well inside and out. And so as I was doing that over my time at that college, I certainly had questions that uh, arose mainly around the interpretation of scripture and, and specifically how Christians had interpreted scripture variously throughout the ages. Mm -hmm. We got very little church history uh, in that, yeah. in that context for obvious reasons. Restorationist movements tend to not find church history very useful sort of by design. Exactly. Yeah. You, yeah. you needed a, a very sharp and quick decline narrative in order to justify kind of the whole thing. So, yes. so you sort of skip over or ease or oversimplify. So I had heard in passing in one class about this guy named origin who allegorized or figuratively read the Bible and so on. And they kind of made fun of it. Like, like in passing, like, mm -hmm. Oh, like here's this little paragraph from, you know, his interpretation of Noah's Ark. How ridiculous is it that he says the, you know, the wood is like the wood of the of the cross and so on. So that actually interested me, though, because I was also having other guys <laughs> like, wait, what? Hold on a second. When when did he live? You know, second, third century. This is bizarre. Um, yeah. You know, because basically what I always had been taught, at least implicitly or explicitly, was, you know, those that kind of wrestle with what we would now what I would call now the historical or the literal sense of text are just wiggling around for progressive or liberal reasons. And so it was quite a shock to me to learn that actually this guy from the second, third century, not just him, way before all the sort of progressive conservative wars, the wars over science and Genesis and all that, was saying stuff like, well, of course, like he says in First Principles, book four, only, a, you know, I don't think anyone would think God actually walked in the garden with Adam and Eve, etc. You know, <laughs> yeah, that they yeah. hid from them. like he's making or, fun or of that it. they sunk their teeth into actual fruit. Or you yes, know, like yes, sort of yes. And he says only a fool would think that. You know, and I was like, wait, what? You know. So anyway, <laughs> that that was it. That was my. You know, simultaneously, I was having questions myself. You know, again, what I didn't know was one of the earliest controversies in the church because I didn't know church history, but I was starting to ask questions about. You know these five or more times that God seems to command genocide in the old Testament scriptures seems like at least on the surface to be somewhat conflicting with, you know, the, the God of Jesus Christ, you know, and so forth. And I, obviously people get really scared about that. All of a sudden it's like, Oh wait, you're, that's a heretic said something like that too at one time. But again, shocked to realize that some of the earliest responses to that heretic Marcion, didn't say something like, you know what, you should just accept the text as it is because it's inspired. So stop asking questions. Instead, they said, well, you know, if we only read it literally, then you'd be right. But we don't. We read it figuratively, mm -hmm. spiritually, et cetera, et cetera. And so the whole controversy unfolds in a quite different way. So all that fascinated me. All that about, you know, different ways to. And so really, I went on to graduate school, my first graduate program, explicitly in historical theology, 
explicitly for personal reasons. And my question was simple. Why does someone like Origen, what are the theological justifications that he has for reading the text the way he does? Because surely he's not just a liberal progressive. Because, <laughs> you know, that doesn't that would make be a, sense. <laughs> that's a strange categorization of origin. In his exactly, context. exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, so, so, but why did he do that? You know, was it just because mm -hmm. he's really Greek or something? And that's what they did to Homer. You know, you know, I don't know. Like, let's, let's see if there's something deeper. So I, that's how I got into sort of what I, what I, what I refer to as sort of the greater Christian tradition, church history, early church fathers, the patristics, whatever you want to call it. And so from there, I kind of just, I kind of just kept going and, you know, the questions, um, kept uh, arising and I just uh, kept studying it. And so I more or less stayed within the patristic era, say the first 700 years of the church. And more or less, I found myself for different reasons drawn towards the East, what, you know, quote unquote, Eastern uh, strands of that tradition, especially the Greeks. Um, but, but, you know, I've also uh, been made to study Latin middle ages, scholasticism, modern theology and so forth. So that's kind of, that's how I kind of got to where I am. I, I I've now been, I have been Catholic now for eight years. Um, that had to do with a, a year I spent, my wife and I spent in France and just sort of us kind of starting to attend the mass there. And I knew I was going to be leaving my childhood tradition. I didn't quite know where. And obviously my affinity for Eastern sources made some people say like, well, you know, sounds like you're going to become Eastern Orthodox of some kind um, or Eastern Catholic or something. Um, and so, but I ended up in, uh, the Roman Catholic side and, uh, and I, I still think I sometimes am ill-fitted for it. <laughs> uh, but, um, my wife was raised in that, in that tradition. And so, uh, it kind of just made sense for different reasons. So that's, that's where I'm at now. That's sort of the, the kind of long version, I guess, but. Sure. I think there's always something a little bit good about being in a church that you're at least somewhat ill-fitted for. I almost <laughs> feel like that's part of the point. <laughs> yes, so, I think that's healthy. <laughs> so, I mean, I won't tell my whole story, but just to give a little bit of context to kind of maybe help the dialogue or anyone coming to this for the first time, I grew up in a very restorationist church, but not part, not one that had roots back to the Stone Campbell movement. Really, my church had roots in the Jesus people or the Jesus movement of like the, the 60s and 70s. Hmm. But its orientation was very, very similar back to the Bible, back to first source, sources, restoring first century Christianity, um, a quick decline narrative, man, almost even by the end of Paul's life, right? Like they were, they were not really getting him and he was bemoaning how no one was listening to what he was saying. And we're going to be faithful, right, to the Bible and, and help uh, restore that. It was um, charismatic, which is probably a different uh, um, ingredient than the church you grew up in. And it was very dispensationalist, right, with, um, you know, a heavy emphasis on end times uh, and, and that sort of thing. But also it was non-Trinitarian, which was the uh, sort of the uniqueness thing. Mm -hmm. And then in my, in college, right, I mostly was comfortable hanging around evangelicals, even though I sort of had this hidden part of my theology that I wouldn't tell them about. <laughs> but for the most part, I could get along with them just fine. And then that ended up coming to a head and I got sort of removed from leadership from my campus fellowship in college because of my non-Trinitarianness and not being able to sign the statement of faith. And that was like, whoa, I need to actually think about this. I just sort of been kind of taking for granted the 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 biblical Unitarian, you know, Christology from my youth. Maybe I actually need to to think about this more, study this more. And that led me into reading things like Athanasius. Like I for kind of in that same restorationist impulse, I'm like, the answer to these questions is probably back in the past, right? I, I need to understand first sources to get a handle of what's going on. Why yeah. is this evangelical campus minister telling me that I can't lead, you know, a Bible study anymore over this Christological question, which he can't even really seem to explain to me, you know? <laughs> so what what's going on? I'll read Athanasius is on the incarnation, which is funny because that's the book that I'm reading now. And I'm like, man, I understand this way better now than the first <laughs> pass that like, there was so much of that I didn't get the first time I read it, reading Augustine and stuff like that. And, and that sort of kind of 
I don't know, enlivened my love of church history too. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so that's, yeah. that's if I could just say there, cause I think this is something you and I really do have in common. And I do think sometimes it's hard for people, even that have grown up in mainline traditions, like anyone that, <laughs> anyone that grew up in a tradition that was very self-consciously a quote unquote historic, at least a branch of historic Christianity they have t they have been able and they can kind of do it through institutional inertia and other things they can kind of just take advantage of the conclusions of mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff that's happened in the past and kind of go with it and yeah you know there's going to be some people that might raise questions or think more deeply about whatever you know in general you know you don't expect like the pope anytime soon to say you know we should maybe rethink the trinity <laughs> so right. yeah like uh, so but what i think sometimes people don't understand for like folks like you and me where we come from is that yeah sometimes like in your case it was a little like this does differ a little bit um um the, say say the trinity thing differs right you guys didn't you didn't have this that conclusion that well the three are one god um and yet probably you and i both did have the conclusion of these 66 books are the inspired bible the, the canon yeah mm-hmm Right. So these are just conclusions that, as you and I both now know, are a hard one and were not at all obvious and took tons of time. Yes. Yeah. There's tons of like activity and debate and yes and no and back and forth. And um, and I think what what that creates for anyone who wants to be thoughtful and that from that background is a sense of I need to go. Yes, there's that restoration impulse that it's it's in the past. But the simultaneously, the more you get to to know the past, the more you realize you you, you were so ignorant of so much of it, and you mm -hmm. in all these se seemingly central core conclusions, which you didn't even know were conclusions, you thought they were just premises, are actually conclusions that that came yes. at the end of a long and so and so. There's this sense of like there's two things at least for me, and I wonder wonder what you think about this. Like if you resonate with this, for me there was one I needed to go back and figure out where everything came from. What, yeah. what happened? That's just, yeah. I'm ignorant, right? But then too, it also, when you do that, you kind of go back with sort of an open, like, I don't, I'm not assuming anything. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened. And so that sometimes has led me, for example, and I think like Matt, this Maximus book would be one where I'm looking, I'm reading him and I'm like, well, you know, a lot of people seem to think like, he's definitely not saying what he seems to be saying, but I don't have any assumptions saying why not. Right. Right. And and you do that. You could do that with Athanasians. I think this is what John Bear is so interesting. Why he's interesting is because he can sort of say, well, I don't know, maybe maybe they do just mean that. So there's that kind of willingness to suspend. Yes. Yes. Right. The, the possibilities or the limits and say, well, let's just see what they actually say and where it goes. Right. And because there was some part of me that was eager to figure out if and how I was probably wrong. That what was part of my motivation for going back into the past, like, oh, maybe this point of view that really disagrees with me is right. And I need to figure out if that's true. They're telling me I'm going to go to hell if I don't get this right. So um, I should at least give that some credence, I suppose, that, that maybe on the off chance they're right. Let me figure, let me make sure. I, I the really, stakes are high. The stakes yes. are high. Right. <laughs> and, and and I do think that there is something of that sort of restorationist background that's sort of like probably most people will misunderstand these things from the past. And that it and that speaks to what we sort of talked about at the very beginning of trying to let them speak for themselves. Like I was reading Athanasius just a couple of days ago, and he's talking about how no one has need for anything outside themselves to come back to God. But the resources to return to God are within you because God is within you and there is no path to God that is outside of you. It's, you just need to look within. I'm like, my goodness, am I reading Ralph Waldo Emerson or am I reading <laughs> Athanasius, right? You know, like it was like the most anti-Calvinist thing that I could imagine. The idea that, that you know, that the resources basically within all of humanity who share in the logos, who share in the, uh, the image of God, have the resources to turn back to God within them. Uh, it's like, I think that there would be a lot of Christians who would train, who would generally like Athanasius, who would try and bat down that kind of idea. No, no, you know, we have to go through Christ and right, you know, there's no salvation outside of Christ and we need a first movement of God's grace, you know, to reach us or something like that. I'm like, 
what if Athanasius actually just means that? Like, right. <laughs> you know, I, my first assumption is that he means what he says and, and that it's going to take something strong otherwise to change my mind on that. Yeah, and that's the kind of remarkable, you know, there is a there is a movement I'm sure you're familiar with in a 20th century Catholic theology called Ressourcement or uh, Nouvelle Théologie, the New Theology, whatever you want to call it. And now it's going to sound like a very Catholic thing at first, but it's going to actually, I think, open up to the point you just made, which is, you know, there was a real kind of strict recalcitrant manualist. In other words, like, here's just all the answers from what were called the neo Thomists at the time, the new. So really they, they think Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, he solved basically all the problems or most of them. And all of this modern thought and criticism, historical criticism, science, etc. We just need to kind of find a bastion of bulwark against the chaos and the, and the unmooring of, of Christian civilization. Mm -hmm. And so you can kind of find that in someone like Thomas's grand system and synthesis, right? And Nouvelle, those guys, knew Thomas. They went to seminary. A lot of them were priests, so they were pretty much brought up on this stuff. Kind of said, you know, the, the tradition's quite larger than just one or two or a handful of guys. <laughs> so maybe we should look into the sources, go back to the sources. Mm -hmm. So we have that kind of restorationist impulse that you and I have for different reasons. Yeah. But they had that, and they kind of throw open the archive, so to speak. Like, let's just see what's there. And so they start doing all these additions and critical additions of the church fathers and lesser known ones and, and, and better known ones, but lesser known works from those big figures, right, et cetera, putting them in their historical context, all that stuff. And I think one of the effects of that, which to their credit, the neo-Thomists who were very afraid of this, at least were kind of right about, was there's a lot of variety in there. You might find an Athanasius saying something that sounds like Ralph Waldo Emerson <laughs> rather than Calvin or Aquinas. And uh, and that's going to kind of actually add to the chaos again, right? Because it's not coming now from without. It's harder to say that Athanasius <laughs> is not a part of the Christian tradition. Yeah. <laughs> or, right. Max, or Maximus, right? So back to some of the, maybe the negative reactions people might have to some of my stuff. It's harder to say, well, St. Maximus the Confessor is not really an orthodox or something. So um, so I think that they were right to be afraid of that, although I, I'm not afraid of that and I doubt that you are. But that's kind of the vitality that you talked about earlier. That's one reason you go back to all these figures, A, because they're important and you want to kind of figure out what happened. But also, yeah, you'll just get shocked by, you'll run across these passages these moments you're like, wait, what am I reading? Who am I reading? Right? What is this? Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, so let's talk a little bit more about Max the Confessor. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about sort of who he, who he is and sort of why he's important, and then we can get into some of his ideas? Yeah, so, Saint, yeah, Maximus the Confessor is, um, I always say this in interviews, you know, it's kind of funny because his life is itself disputed. Like, where he was even born is disputed. There's different versions of it. Part of that is a is the fruit of controversy, so back then and maybe even still today when you have a really heated debate and controversy uh, you know one side tends to want to smear the other so they'll tell stories about you know there's there's this one uh life of maximus it's called uh where it's like he's a bastard child and <laughs> he's born out yeah. of wedlock and his 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 mom drops him off on the footsteps of a monastery that just wouldn't you know it you know is uh is the seed bed of heresy and so mm -hmm. they raise him, and that explains why he goes on to do all this heretical stuff. So, but uh, nevertheless, basically, here's a thumbnail of what we know about Maximus fairly certainly. Um, he is a lay monk. He's got no official position in the church. He's not a priest or a bishop or anything like that. And yet, as a kind of an anecdote that illustrates his importance, he is so influential, even without the formal power. I mean, he's got a network, of course. I'm not saying he doesn't have powerful friends or whatever. But he himself is so influential that he ends up dying and becoming what's called a confessor uh, because he's tortured as an 80-year-old man. His right hand is cut off. His his tongue is cut out. And he dies and, two and years And those later. are specifically so he can't write or speak, right? Exactly. Literally uh, removing his ability to teach. Exactly. Yeah, this lay monk who's not preaching sermons, you know, he's not out there preaching sermons. Most of his work, in fact, that we have are, are responses to inquiries, 
people asking his opinion about things. Um, I'm right in the, and right now I'm in the middle of translating 49, his 40, 49 of his letters, which uh, only like two of which have ever been translated to English. So I'm trying to translate all of them for one volume. So a lot of this stuff, it's just people writing to him. His two major works are that some abbot of whatever monastery in you know, in North Africa or the, or Palestine basically sends Maximus a list of, uh, difficult to interpret or ambiguous questions, say in, uh, Gregory of, the, of Nazianzus, the church father called Gregory the Theologian, one of the Cappadocian fathers. And he's got all these orations that are beautiful, but sometimes he says things that, once again, like to our point earlier, right, sound kind of like, wow, that's surprising, that's shocking. It's, <laughs> yeah. And so people will just send a li important people send lists of these passages to Maximus and basically say, you know, what does this mean? <laughs> what what's going on here? And so he's so a lot of his work is that kind of thing. Same thing with scripture. There's a whole another massive work of Maximus that's just difficult scriptures. What does this mean? Explain this to me. What is what does Saint you know what does Peter mean here in this passage? So a lot. Of, so that's kind of I think that illustrates though his his gravitas, his importance. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I mean, people were you know the emperor of the Eastern Empire and some really high up church leaders were not just. Um, disturbed by what Maximus thought, they just they were disturbed by the very fact that he wouldn't stop talking about Christology and being wading in in the controversies, which for them had political ramifications. Obviously, right. dividing up people and so forth, and making fractions in the church and therefore in society. But uh, but they 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 were so concerned with his influence and feared it. That they that they had him tortured that way as an eighty year old man, a monk. Yeah, and so that that already in his lifetime, he's sort of you can see there, regardless of his origins and exactly, we don't really know how he was educated. I don't know, even though I wrote a book on, I don't know why he 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 at one point quotes Josephus. Um, he seems to be aware of Neoplatonic philosophers, although he rarely names them. He certainly knows the Christian tradition backwards and forwards, and we could talk about what figures there, you know, Dionysius, the Cappadocians of Agrius, origin. But um, I don't know where he learned. I, I don't, we, nobody really knows. So he just kind of, maybe he spent a lot of time in a monastery that had a great library and was just a very curious, self-taught yes. sort of person. Yeah, and I, I actually tend to think there's one thesis out there that does take a cue from that more polemical life of Maximus that argues that probably he was born and, and raised in Palestine. And there are mm -hmm. some pretty important monasteries in Palestine and, by the way, monasteries that historically had been sort of uh, home bases for quote-unquote originist teaching. Right, because Origen's home base was in Caesarea, which is in yeah, yeah Israel slash Palestine. Right. Yes, so kind of that North Africa, like Alexandria, Palestine, that whole little like, region there. He definitely seems to have been embedded in that network, and he seems to have gotten his education somewhere in, in there. So, so, uh, but yeah, I, I think that's so. He ends up being yeah, he ends up dying from his afflictions. This is by the way around six sixty uh, A.D. And uh, so 19 years after his death, you have the ecumenical council at, um, uh, shoot, I'm now blanking on it. Ephesus? Jeez. This, uh, it's the sixth ecumenical council. Um, they, it, they important Eastern city. <laughs> yes. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You know, one of those Constantinople, I see it, something like that. It's not, I see yeah. it, but yeah. So um, yeah. And, and so 19 years later, he's, Basically, they say he's right. Now, just quickly throwing it out there for those that might not know, he is Maximus is sort of the champion and defender of what is now called diothelitism, which is the idea that dio, dio is two, thelitis is, you know, um, wills. And it's this doctrine that says uh, Christ had two wills, faculties of willing, by the way. And not like he willed two different things at once, but that power by which like you will, we would call a human power or a human faculty, like a rational faculty. You can will for your own reasons or not. You can come up, you can be persuaded or not. This is sort of your power or capacity to will ration, and rationally think and desire. And so Maximus says we need to, and it's going to sound like a real weird, to like way out there recondite debate that the only nerds are interested in. But he died for this. You know, he's tortured for this. He says that we have to say that Christ has a human will, capacity to will, and a divine capacity to will. 
And for Maximus, that's more or less just the implication of the Christology promulgated at the Council of Chalcedon, mm -hmm. 451, which said Christ is both fully God and fully man, two natures. For Maximus, willing is a natural power. And so if he does have two natures, that's a, that's a kind of starting point in this argument, then he must therefore have two modes of willing or powers, I should say, capacities of willing, human and divine. That sounds like a kind of really weird in the weeds debate. But at the time, this is why I think people miss. These sounds. This sounds like a kind of dotting the I, crossing the T sort of way down the line. But it's not really the way these things work. These debates yeah. are flashpoints for rethinking the whole tradition prior. That's the more important point. Right. And and virtually every Christological or Trinitarian controversy has this sort of flavor to it. Like yes. when you really dig into the weeds, you know, the Arians and the anti-Arians were way more similar than most people realize. And it's like, so wait a minute, we're, we're saying that there are you know, three hypostases and three usias or three hypostases and one usia. And that it, and it's like, OK, so there is a son that is begotten and then receives the nature versus there's a son that's begotten at a certain time and receives a slightly different nature. You know, right. it's like it's actually very fine point. It's like, how could the whole empire be upset about this? But like, Actually, it was. And sometimes I feel like there's a little bit of a, all right, guys, chill out, right? You know, take some perspective yes. on that. Sometimes that does seem like maybe some advice that an outsider would give. But yet you can also see that there really are real things at stake in the life of the church and, and what that will mean. But then there's often an element of um, political um, uh, intrigue in the whole thing, because which side wins determines which side will be in power once the dust settles. And right. then there's oftentimes a geographic or cultural or linguistic power struggle kind of going on at the same time where one region of the empire might support a certain theological stance and a different region doesn't. And sometimes that will even lead to the, the breaking apart of the empire, right? Uh, over yeah. some of these Christological or Trinitarian controversies and from the Council of Nicaea all the way through Maximus's time, um, there are these things. But I also, you know, I'm, I don't, I, I feel like it's also important to take the theology seriously mm -hmm. and that the people at the time weren't just doing this cynically, right? It wasn't like, right. ha, I know we're going to get the Egyptians kicked out of the empire by <laughs> getting really mad at them about their Miaphysitism, right? <laughs> yeah, or something exactly. like that. And we're going to, you know, make a, a holy stink about this new topic. Uh, it wasn't right. it wasn't cynical. I think that there were people who really cared about it. Right. Well, yeah. And, and and actually, Maximus is a, is a great example of your point, because so, for example, early on, um, there was that exact temp attempt that you said, which, by the way, had had been attempted in the fourth century too. Hillary of Poitiers calls it out. And, but uh, over over um, over the divinity of Christ stuff. But um, yeah, it, it, earlier on, there was there ha, there had been attempts at reproachment of reconciliation, right? And one of them came from kind of high up. It was supported by a few patriarchs, etc. And it basically said, "Look, we can use different language that might even sound contradictory, but as long as we sort of vague, basically don't rule each other out." So it's a kind of toleration, right? Yeah. Or, or, or even another attempt was like, why don't we just not talk about this? <laughs> you know, yeah. like you can think what you want, you know. And on the surface, it does sound like that's that's a that's a good idea, or at least some sort of salutary advice. And in one of his early letters, Maximus, when he's writing to somebody who's supporting one of these policies, he kind of actually says like, um, okay. Like, I can see this. This is all right. But I have a few questions. Mm -hmm. And he raises a few questions about some of the language in the document. Um, well, by the by, about 10 or 15 years later, there's a full-blown controversy involved. And so my, my point is here. And then again, he's a lay monk. And at the end of his life, he basically thinks the emperor, which well, this is part is true. He thinks the emperor is against him. The local bishop where he's imprisoned, essentially, is against him. And he's caught word that the new pope, because the prior pope was was for him, was with him, and actually also was himself uh, 
kind of embarrassingly dragged across the empire and imprisoned as well over in the east, uh, Pope Martin. Uh, but the new pope seems to have turned against Maximus's teaching against him. So Maximus actually suffers, is tortured, and dies, basically thinking all of those people are now arrayed against him. And, right. and so the que the question arises. That brings up what? an interesting question of ecclesial right. versus independent authority. There's that. It, absolutely, it does. And I actually, actually, even some of the stuff in the records of some of his last uh, like interrogations, that even more, that's even more the case. It's very clear. But also, um, what in the world, what political strategy is Maximus <laughs> caring about here? He, he He's gaining nothing. He's losing everything. Yeah. And he's nothing really to gain. And so it really does seem like he's at least one of those figures that far from being like cynical and sort of just doing power machinations type thing, power plays. He really is. He really thinks something's at stake. And, you know, you could disagree with him or not, but that is his it does seem to be his primary motivation so far as we can you know, tell. So, right. It's not like it's not like imagine that the current um, patriarch of Constantinople decided to read through all the writings of like um, the patriarch of Moscow and be like, actually he, some obscure Christological distinction that no one had ever really cared about in the past is suddenly really important that we have this answer. Whereas the patriarch of Moscow has this bad answer and yeah. now we're going to excommunicate them and everyone would know, Oh, this is actually about the war in Ukraine. Not, right. <laughs> not a, right. It, so, some of the controversies have that kind of sure. political intrigue to them, but some of them don't. And then some of them, it, it happens later. Yeah, it, it, it's complicated. So yeah. um, another so another couple things that I wanted to um, mention or ask about. So Max the Confessor, Maximus the Confessor, the Confessor is the title of someone who under torture or duress confesses Christ. But that, that title came from the pagan phase of the empire when someone would be brought in for a pagan persecution of Christians and even under torture um, or threat of property or what have you continued to confess Christ and they didn't end up dying, but, but they, they still made the good confession. What's mm -hmm. interesting is that Max has the title of the confessor, but his torturers are Christian. So right. uh, how how often or common is that to get the title of confessor when the people that you're confessing Christ to also claim to be Christians that were just on the other side of a controversy that you'll eventually get vindicated on? I don't know of any other example of something. Like I know that. of I know of one other called a confessor, but I, I don't know the details of his life well enough to recount it here. But no, you're right. It is it is kind of it is rare. And um, and it kind of does reflect, right, because that's a title, of course, it's given to him later. And it's from the perspective of 19 years later, that ecumenical council, which decides actually that his his position mm -hmm. is what's going to be, quote, the orthodox position now. And so when you look back and you read the history and you say, you know, yes, he was killed by Christians at, and at that time, but um, he was defending the truth. He was confessing Christ, Christ fully and, and truly. And so he's a confessor, even though it is technically right that he died at the hands of other Christians. But they had kind of a, you know, it's always, and this is the thing about tradition, you you know, well, there is this kind of double speak, if I could be blunt about it. Um, there's this sense, like, for example, right, uh, there's this right, apparently right now on, online, there's this big controversy about icon veneration and how early it goes into the tradition. And when you get to Nicaea too, of course, they're going to say, yeah, this is always what we've done. We've never done it any other way. This is the faith. Of the I, Father. There are some right. quotes of Athanasius that I think would uh, rankle some iconophiles. Yes. Uh, yes. If, if, yes. <laughs> yeah. And so so you've got, you know, look, this is part of what it means to be modern looking at this stuff. We are aware of a difference between the rhetoric used and the reality. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're not so, you know, and you got to judge in case by case. But in that case, it's like, look, however you cash that out, and wherever you fall on that, it, it just does seem to be obvious that there were some pretty major developments, developments that seem to even in some ways contradict earlier moments. And so um, and similarly here, I think with Maximus, you know, it's sort of like now at the time. And this is where that thing you said earlier is important. The independent thought versus authority is interesting. I mean, Maximus is straight out, uh, straight out asked, um, um, you know, like, like, why are you contradicting, you know, for example, um, uh, Cyril of Alexandria, who at that time is a huge authority now. 
St. Cyril of Alexandria says this, and there's a quote, and it is from him. And it does seem to basically say there's one will mm -hmm. or one activity and one will. Um, and or or you know, they could produce from Dionysius the Areopagite, for, which at the time was considered an early saint. Dionysius, mm -hmm. one of the converts of Paul from Acts 17 in Athens, and the first bishop of Athens or whatever. Right. And Dionysius so, had almost quasi-apostolic authority because he's yes. mentioned in the New Testament, even though most historians would say that those writings under are under a pseudonym from like the fifth century. Right? Exactly. They right. didn't yeah. know that at the time or believe that at the time. Exactly. And so and so, you know. Again, that can be produced when, you know, Epistle 4 from Dionysius seems to say something. I mean, it's in the singular and it calls Christ's activity. It, it speaks of it as one act. Like, it doesn't say one. And Maximus makes a big deal about that. It doesn't say one, but it does say a certain activity mm -hmm. in the singular. And so he has to kind of wrestle with that. Interpret so so he is already being opposed. His views are being opposed by citing authorities. And some too will, will cite synods. And, and there's even a moment in one of the disputes, and this is later, I'm talking like one of the last things, you know, that happens to him. So he's an old guy and they're like citing some synod from the fourth or fifth century that, and he says, you know, he makes an argument basically about why that sentiment synod's not legitimate because it was like illegitimately convened by a political authority or whatever. So there's already this like sense of like struggle and back and forth. And, and he really is saying something that, technically at that time it is it was just objectively the case that exactly what maximus was saying was not official church doctrine that that really is true i mean there's no way to get around that and that that's why there's all this antagonism and there's a sort mm -hmm. of you know uh heated controversy however later after his death 19 years later his views adopted now it is official and so right. there's this kind of rhetoric and that so goes back it, is it right because he had a, v a view to the truth, right? And he was speaking of that. Or is it right because he was vindicated by the bulk of better councils that had more authority than the people who were condemning him at the time? Even though, like yes. you said, during his lifetime, he was condemned by the Bishop of Rome, his local bishop, and the emperor, right? So right, it's yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And people, you know, modern Catholics today will sort of want to, you know, they will basically, in my opinion, somewhat anachronistically look back and say, and these are my fellow you know, fellow Catholics here. And they'll say, well, that's not really the magisterium because the magisterium has to be X and they'll define it in a way that's basically from the 19th century. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like, well, OK, but nobody was looking for that back then. And so, uh, OK, so that's one way to explain it. But the, but the other thing is just to kind of frankly admit what you've what you just said is putting your finger on something that is just a perennial tension in tradition itself. Because look, 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 here's what's really odd. Let's let's get very specific. The ecumenical six ecumenical council vindicates Maximus. That does officially. And I don't think it's hard to see ecumenical now what counts as an ecumenical council okay that is that's a little more but let's just say yeah, for and now, the that, arians would be like hey what about our ecumenical council exactly they right. look perfectly ecumenical to us <laughs> right yeah especially compared to like say 431 whoops like 431 yeah. right where you got you know the the baron council and the, it started before the other groups even there and so uh totally uh that's all that's all really messy but let's just say for a second that let's just uh, concede that the six ecumenical council is ecumenical and it does vindicate Maximus's views. Um, and, and so some might say, well, so that's why he's right. Or he's recognized as being right because that the authority of the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Okay. Um, and we're prescending from anything like development and so forth, which if you look at all the councils, you'll, you'll see that there is that, but let's just, let's just accept that for now. Well, when you go back to Maximus, you're like, okay, so you're saying he's right. Well, he's actually explicitly questioned about what makes uh, a synodal or a creedal definition true. He's actually explicitly asked that. The dispute of Bizia, Bizia, it's like around section four, says, um, what makes these true? Are these true because they're promulgated or or something else? And he, he Maximus himself takes the position that the only thing that makes uh, a pronouncement or a creedal statement or whatever true is the, is the truth itself. Mm -hmm. so he doesn't end by appealing to a human authority he says that the reason why these things are true is be, is insofar as they disclose what just is or who he who is the truth and so now it's we're in an interesting position because on the one hand 
the ecumenical council with its authority as ratified Maximus is teaching. And I'm not saying everything he ever said. I know people will quibble with that. However, the person that they ratified retro retroactively, he himself thought he, he himself would seem to say that what makes the ecumenical councils ratification true is simply the truth. Mm -hmm. So what is it? Is it the truth or the authority, you know, and Augustine's already wrestled with this and other people have, and we still really are in a lot of ways. So um, yeah, and, anyway. and it's similar to Origen's own lifetime. Origen was wrestling with the same question because he had, I'm not sure if he got excommunicated or if he just sort of ran afoul of his own bishop in Alexandria. And then he moves to Caesarea where he has a sympathetic bishop. And he, I think he gets appointed a presbyter, I believe. But he does. Um, yeah. And then, and then he has his patrons who are giving him the financial resources to do his sort of research. But you can see a lot of times in Origen's writing where he he seems to recognize the authority of church structure, but then almost have this parallel authority of scriptural exegesis as its own authority and that these things need to communicate and counterbalance each other. Yes. In fact, and just a quick note about Origen's biography. In fact, he was already being invited to give homilies prior to ordination. Which, you know, we're, we're talking early in church history, so there was a little less formal right. strictures here. And there had just the, been a persecution that might have wiped out a fair amount yes. of the properly ordained current clergy. And yeah, stuff like and, that. and yeah. yeah, including his own father, who was martyred um, but uh, in Alexandria. But yeah, he's he's being invited to Jerusalem to, to give homilies. He's being to Caesarea. And then, like you said, eventually he gets ordained. Both of those bishops are supportive, and he resides in Caesarea, and he's got patrons and so on. And so a lot of his... A lot of his work we we even now still find, like you know, the Psalms homilies are are uh, are homilies. He's stuff he you know preached in church. But but yeah, exactly. And and you know, Origen's conviction. So this is so perennially relevant, I think. It's it's this. <laughs> I'm just gonna say it straight out because I, I'm ready to. <laughs> um look, we have a problem if you think these two things that God has revealed God's self. That's let's just, and I'm going to leave it vague right now, like how and where and all that. Let's just say God has revealed God's self. And yet we can definitively place limits and boundaries on what that revelation is and entails. Those don't go together. Mm -hmm. They can go together in a certain sort of organic dynamic way. I, and I think that itself is the dynamism of tradition unfolded. It's why you get these long sort of processes. But you can't simply hold to one or the other absolutely. Because on the one hand, if it can be limited, and this is origin says this about scripture already, like straight out. If it can be limited in its meaning, this is back to my, my biography, right? His theological justification for allegory. Well, this is one of them. It's divine. Mm -hmm. Scripture is divine. He even calls it in the first uh, homily in Leviticus. He says, it's the word made page. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the word is divine. And so here's the thing. If it's divine, it cannot be limited. That does not mean everything goes. It means right. what goes is infinite. Those mm -hmm. are two different things. So here, that's, that's okay. So that's one. So if God really is the thing or reality, I should say, or person or whatever, revealed, then that can't have an end and remain God. And yet it is true that it's revealed to us. And insofar as it's revealed to us, yes, we're of, of course we're going to begin with fragmentary grasping with, well, we kind of understand this, but we don't really understand this. And we're going like, to, and that's going to be the dynamism. Those two, so that they, they are, they're dynamically united, I think, but as a dynamic, as a movement, a motion. And so, and so I think like that's that's a kind of fundament that animates what some scholars call origins zetetic spirit, which is zetesis, which is searching or investigating or seeking out. It's a word that that origin used. It's a word that Maximus uses as well in his defense. Zet zet zetin is like I'm I'm going to seek out. I'm going to investigate. And he quotes the Psalms at one point. He says, "For I have heard it said, seek after me, seek after the things of God." And it's like Psalm something or other. So. And uh, all that to say, this is this is the very dynamism, and an attempt to put a lid on one or the other will fail. It's going to explode from within. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
And I, I think that that's very right. And even sort of ties back to what we were talking about earlier in sort of the restoration movement about how it's very much swung to one pole of that, right? Like an individual and the Bible is the authority, right? But then that, like you brought up the question, well, then why those 66 books exactly, right? right. You know, like what's the history of that? And it's like, oh, well, it turns out that Origin and Athanasius both had a lot to do with why it's those 66 books in your hand. Right, <laughs> right, right. exactly. And, uh, so then, so then how, why do you make sense of that, right? And, and so there is this sort of weird dynamic interplay with the um, unlimited infinite truth that is to be revealed through these things and the finite contingent um, happenings of history that have led to where you are now. And yes. so... I feel like that's still something that I wrestle with. I'm sort of more on the other end of the spectrum, but still being like, okay, well, I need to sort of make, I, I can't like, you know, completely jettison tradition because that will lead in some of its own weird paradoxes and, um, and contradictions to do that too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in some ways we could say uh, there are two ways to, f to try to uh, limit the infinite. One would be to be a strict traditionalist and just say, actually, we figured it all out. We're good. Mm -hmm. No more, no more thinking. Here's the definition. Here's the formula. Repeat back, repeat after me. Right. Et cetera. Right. Yeah. Just find the right summa and you've got your answer. Exactly. Yeah. And here I'll, I'll quote a, uh, uh, one of my, uh, one of my favorite 20th century Catholic theologians, Carl Rahner. Uh, and, um, and he says, you know, at one point he says, if all we do, and he's talking about crystal, he's actually talking about Chalcedon in this essay. It's a great essay. He says, if all we do is repeat the formula, we haven't understood the formula. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a sign that you quite, you actually don't quite understand it. Because if you understood it, you would be more than it. You could explain it otherwise. You could, it, you could yeah. draw out implications, right? But if you just are stuck. So anyway, so that's one way to find it, like make finite the infinite is to just be a receptive, supposedly passive traditionalist. Um, and actually, a lot of Maximus' accusers were basically that. At least they styled themselves that. At one mm -hmm. point, he's actually he's actually said, why don't you just repeat the words and do not elaborate on them? Yeah. The words of St. Cyril, the words of Dionysius, whatever. And he yeah. says, he, he says brilliantly, please tell me the difference between repeating the words and elaborating on them. Of course, that would be an elaboration if they gave an answer. So he trapped them, you know, yeah. and, uh, and uh, but but the deeper point isn't just a trap. The point is you can't receive without actively understanding. Right, right. And this is one of the reasons why I'm excited to talk to you is I feel like you do a good job of digging back into this Christology stuff, but making it seem alive and active and something to continue worth thinking and, uh, dare I say, elaborating on, <laughs> yeah. where, whereas there are a fair number of people on YouTube or podcasts, I won't name any names right now, but when they talk about Christology, it sounds like they're almost reading from a textbook. <laughs> and that I can almost sense a, 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 a fear that if they set one foot in the wrong place, that they could get in trouble, especially on this particular topic. And I have sympathy for that. But, yeah. um, but it doesn't sound like they've internalized it in such a way that they can speak from that perspective beyond just repeating things from the past. Yes. And I think, look, that's, that's a dead end. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. I don't mean to be um, I, I like like you, right? I was raised in that context. Like, I know what it's like to be afraid of trespassing the boundaries. I know what it's like to be told your questions aren't welcome. I know what it's like to be told those are temptations. Whereas the truth is, questions really ought to be seen. I think not. I mean, obviously, some people can ask questions in in, in ill will. Okay, I get it. Bad faith, mm -hmm. uh, but. Actually, to me, this is why I always used to say to my students when I taught, I said, you know, to me, that one of the greatest and maybe perhaps the first real theologian was Job. Mm -hmm. Because his questioning, his protesting against God is a sign of his deeper trust in God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't ask a question to somebody that you don't even believe is worthwhile or trustworthy to give a good answer, even if the answer is I don't know, you know. Uh, my kids ask me questions, not because I'm really smart. I know everything, even though I say I tell them I do. <laughs> but they, <laughs> I think at least one reason why they ask me questions is because they, they, you know, 
they kind of think, well, even if dad doesn't know, like he'll tell me, like he'll, he'll, he's not going to be lying to me in other words. So anyway, all that to say, I, uh, I'm very much on the side of, um, I think Maximus is right. I think, you know, uh, a lot of other figures I would point to are right to say, um, you can't actually truly receive tradition. And certainly not the, tradi- you know, that which carries the self-revelation of God. If you believe that about the tradition, you can't actually receive it without actively responding to it. I mean, mm-hmm. Paul says we have the mind of Christ and the spirit that searches even the depths of God in us. That's either true or it isn't. And so to shut down questions or to pretend like the formula, it meant mark an end. And actually that that essay, by the way, that I quoted for Ronder from it, the, the, the German original, what it's called is Chalcedon beginning or end. And he comes down on it's just the beginning. It's not the end mm-hmm. of anything. It's not, it didn't settle really much of anything. It's the beginning of a different, you know. So I, I'm very much in line with that way of conceiving tradition broadly. But then, yeah, there's that other side, right? The other way you could possibly make infi- uh, finite or limited the infinite is if you did just say, you know what? I'm going to throw out all the tradition, everything that's come before. I'm just going to kind of sit here and on twiddle my thumbs and think for myself and kind of think, well, what do I think? Okay, so, mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> surely... With enough self awareness, we each know that we're all limited in our understanding, <laughs> that yeah. we don't know everything, that we haven't thought through everything or every objection or implication. And so, that if you just in principle accepted that, and, and I don't actually think almost anyone does this, but I'm just saying that's the other extreme, right? Would be I don't need any of that old stuff, it's all about the new stuff, and and you sort of disconnect it altogether. Yeah, that's another way to just in principle, which is a contradiction, make the infinite finite. Mm-hmm. And um, and so I think there's something like a synthesis that has to has to be in the very act of receiving the tradition actively that occurs in the on the level of action and life and vitality rather than on the abstract level of either being a traditionalist and accepting formulas or being a kind of uh, in principle progressivist that just simply does away with all mm-hmm. those are those are simply two sides of the same coin, I think. Yeah, hyper hyper traditionalism and hyper presentism, or whatever right. you might call it, have the weird sort of thing ha- have a weird sort of thing in common. Uh, yes, really. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Of sort of kind of putting the present in a weird relationship to the past. Yeah, exactly. It, it basically isolates both from each other, right? It says mm-hmm. our age is our age, and it's almost like it's beginningless. It didn't even yeah. have prior history or you could cut off or you could look at the other side of the divide and say, you know, all that old stuff or pre-modern tradition or whatever is just kind of that was like an island in in the in the in the stream of time. And we're yeah. way beyond that. And it has no relation to us. Well, that's both of those are easy. Those yeah. are easy. And our, our new enlightened perspective have has no roots in that past. It's just right. suddenly <laughs> come down upon us now. Yeah. Right. And and we can stand uh mountains above the past and look down on it from our new perspective. Even yeah. though yeah. Yeah, that exactly. That that it, it's so interesting how even that sort of side of it needs a narrative that basically makes what's happened in the last five hundred years, say in the Western. Uh, you know, tradition, philosophy, sciences, et cetera, somehow alien to Christianity itself, mm-hmm. which yeah. I think anyone who's really studied this stuff somewhat, I, I, the other thing I do kind of on the side, besides all this patristic stuff is I, I spend time in the 19th century German philosophy. I'm translating Schelling right now. And it's just obvious that <laughs> um, you might not like the developments there. You might think it's all nonsense or whatever. That's fine. Those are different discussions, but, but to say it's like, basically just a recrudescence of some sort of Gnostic alien movement, you know, alien to the Christian, real Christian tradition. That's all nonsense. It's nonsense. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Anyway. Interesting. Yeah. So um, let, let's dig into, you know, th- this channel, if anything, doesn't mind a good meaty Christological controversy. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, it, it, if you've gotten this far already, I suspect you're sort of the person who actually is like, yeah, actually, I find those Christological controversies kind of interesting, you know? Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, so what, what was Maximus's um, kind of, 
what what was the Christological controversy in Maximus's life, and what was his take, and what were his his, his opponents' takes? We sort of mentioned the one will versus two will things, but mm -hmm. that's sort of a, a a simple way of describing something that's very complex. Yeah, yeah. So the deeper issue, really, I think the the the, the context that we want to think about these controversies in is post Chalcedonian debates and controversies. In other words, I say post Chalcedonian because I'm marking 451 Chalcedon's attempt to bring together already two warring or antagonistic strands of Christology. Mm -hmm. One would, and, and there are more, and, and there are variations, etc. Yeah, maybe so, we should talk a little bit about Chalcedon or Chalcedon before yes. before we even get to Maximus. So, what what was going on at Chalcedon, and what were the warring camps back then? Yes. So here's here's the kind of quick way to do it. I don't think it's actually too oversimplified. You basically have two two parties or strands or tendencies in the tradition prior to Chalcedon, like the last hundred or hundred fifty years prior to Chalcedon. On the one hand, you have what is called um, uh, a single subject Christology, usually championed by Saint Cyril of Alexandria. And just just to make it plain, it's it's sort of the intuition is this: whatever you say about Jesus Christ, there is one, and it's kind of like already a blank. There's one agent, one actor, one referent, one character, one referent, one reality, one person, one character. Yeah, even the, I saw, I've seen one scholar do that. I think it's helpful. It's like, look in the Gospels themselves, there is one character, like you said, right? And mm -hmm. and and the Son of Man and the Son of God are the same in some way, mm -hmm. such mm -hmm. that what happens to one happens to the other. Therefore, they're not totally other. Right. They're they're one. There's one center of um, agency or action and passion. Uh, so that's Cyril. Is That's his starting point and kind of governing point or rule mm -hmm. is whatever else we go on to say about Jesus and, he, you know, in his two natures or and Cyril himself waffled on this, you know, on different points. Sometimes he's OK with saying there are two essences there's the divine essence. There's the uh, human essence. Sometimes he wants to say even that sounds too divisive, uh, too much like separating in the middle of Christ, down the middle of Christ, separating his two sides, as it were. And so he'll use other formulations, sometimes very provocative ones. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he's the one who's going to become famous for talking about the suffering, the, God's life-giving sufferings. He says like God sometimes, right? So so he's equating God in some way with Christ, this one subject, who is nevertheless the one who's also crucified, tortured, mm -hmm. dead, right? And so very frail, seems like a creature, right? He's less interested in the precision. In fact, he, there's one uh, um, letter I love. I think it's either letter 45 or 46 in, in his epistles where he, he says he opposes those who, quote, speak with undue precision about the Lord's life-giving sufferings. He means there those who say, well, and this will be introduced to the other side. Well, you know, someone like Nestorius, who's going to be the champion for the other side, is going to say, you know, there's some things about God that simply can't be predicated of this man, Jesus, and vice versa, at least not straightforwardly. And so something like suffering seems to be something very not godlike and would like who is suffering, right? And so Nestorius or some people in, uh, sympathetic to Nestorius, and sometimes this is cashed out as Cyril represents the Alexandrian tradition, Nestorius represents the Antiochian tradition. Those are kind of misnomers, but let's just, we'll just go I, on. I, I think the whole general Antioch versus Alexandria dichotomy, I, I don't. I don't see that. Right. I, I know that, that that was popular in scholarship for a while. I feel like that's one of those ideas that can be kind of left aside as not helpful. Yeah. I mean, even just even to the point of like just geographical accuracy, right? Like later, one of the great champions of, the, of what I'm now describing is the one subject, you know, or later me, a physicist mm -hmm. uh, Christology is Severus of Antioch. <laughs> so, right. You know, so. and, and whereas Origen, if anything, could be criticized as being a little bit too separate in the way he treats yeah. the human and the, and the divine. And so if Origen is on the Antiochian side, but he's like the Alexandrian. most Alexandrian. Right. Yeah. Anyway, so like, yeah, same, well, same with Evagrius. Right. Same with Evagrius, right? Who's who's sort of the great uh, disciple or sort of representation of quote unquote originism. And and yet I, I at least am one of those who take the opinion that 
his Gnostic chapters, there's quite a, quite, a, quite a clear way of interpreting that as a kind of separate Christology or two, two subjects. So that's the kind of two sides would be, well, on the one hand, one subject Christology says, whatever else you say about the divinity and humanity of Jesus, what you have to say is there's one subject, agent, person, the, the terms vary. And, and there aren't two centers or subsistent things that separately subsist. The mm. other side would would, and again, this is gonna this will begin oversimplifying because Nestorius himself evolves on this, and, and at the end of his life, he's sort of trying to work this out differently. But let's just say the other side would be something like a two-subject Christology, even though you might relate those two subjectly and uh, subjects in really intimate ways, they overlap in ways or whatever. Let's just say. Still, nevertheless, what can be said of one cannot necessarily strictly be said of the other. So the one who is born famously, right, who is born of Mary, is that God? So that you call her Theotokos, the God bearer, the mother of God? Or as Nestorius earlier on said, I just want to call him mother of Christ, so, of course, the question is raised, well, then hold on. Is God different, like the Son of God different from Christ? Mm -hmm. And you would sort of, the implication kind of has to be, yeah, sort of in some way. Yeah, yeah. And um, that, that question of suffering is a really pointed one on this question. You know, yes. who? Uh, what is Mary the mother of is one way of asking this. Who was tempted is a way of asking this. Yes. Uh, and But especially yes. who, who suffered. Because back during, back in like the, the pre-Nicene period, um, there were the the father sufferers, the patripassionists, who were we might call modalists or something, right? Who sort of think that the person that was incarnate was the father, right? Yes. And that father, son, spirit might be just sort of aspects or modes of of a unipersonal God or something like that, yep. right? And so the the main tradition that leads up to orthodoxy was always against that idea that it was the father that suffered. But there was sort of an Aryan way of answering that, which is that the son that's suffering, it, it maybe it's one subject, right? But it's he's not as divine as the high God, so right. that that's why he's the sort of God that can die and suffer, whereas exactly. his father is not the sort of God who can die and suffer. And then that makes to have distinctions in the divinity of the son and the father, right? But then after Nicaea, that starts to get harder and more complicated to take that exactly. route of the reason why the son can suffer is not because yes. he's, uh, you know, to, it, it, you know, you can't have full divinity suffering, or at least that the tradition has been resistant to that idea. Yes. So that's exact. That's really well put, Sam. It's, that, that's crucial because mm -hmm. what, what you, what you're saying there is that an earlier controversy in the tradition depended so much on a stance that said, God, divinity, the father does not suffer in, in one context for one debate that later on new context arises post Nicaea, which has now, now, as you said, kind of closed off seemingly the Aryan but, uh, possibility and said, no, 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 no. It's got the son of God is just as much, no less fully divine, uh, you know, just as fully divine as the father. And so there's that kind of like next logical connection then that just was never made because it didn't have the kind of pressure that post Nicaea does to say, well, hold on a second. If we made such a big deal about the father not being incarnate precisely because full divinity doesn't suffer. And yet, and so that's obviously why the one who did suffer the son on the cross is not the father. Now, when we're, we're saying at a further stage in the, in the development, well, actually though, the son is fully divine just as much as the father well, then hold on. Does that now mean the earlier conclusion from divinity applies to the son? And actually, I do think that's kind of the way Nestorius was thinking. Mm -hmm. Like what he's he thinks he's defending Nicaea. That's the key point. Yeah. And so he's, does Cyril. He's, defend, he's defending the full divinity of the son by Absolutely. allowing some things to be kind of true of the human part, but not necessarily be true of the divine part. Exactly. Right, because if one of the if one of the Trinity, say the second person of the Trinity, can be born and have a human mother, well, then hold on. If he's fully, if that if the one who is born is fully God, uh, but then the Father, of course, could never be originated by anyone, let alone a human being. Now we're seeming to to, to fall back into the division and in, in divinity between the two. Mm -hmm. So, so Nestorius, exactly what you said, thinks he's his way is defending the Nicene Creed. <laughs> 
essentially, to confess the full divinity of the Son. And in order to do that, you need to follow out the implication logically and say, okay, so yes, there is Father, Son, and Spirit. They're all consubstantial. They're all equally divine, equally impassable, equally eternal, equally, right, all that. Uh, therefore, whoever is born of Mary, whoever suffers birth, you might say, <laughs> whoever is given being, receives it in that way, in a temp temporal, finite way, well, that one can't simply be the same subject as the one we just fought about and defended as, as a consubstantial with the Father. Mm -hmm. So now we have a son who is consubstantial with the Father and a Christ who is born. And so at least somehow differs in essence some way from the, 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 the high God. And so then the question becomes, well, hold on, then how does the son relate to that, which is uh, he who was born of, of Mary? Right, right. And, and Nestorius at first is digging his heels in. He tries to mollify it later and say, well, okay, there are still two subjects, but they can relate. They can become one person in a way, but they still remain two. Um, uh, the word he uses, I think he uses hypostasis later in his later work, but he says they can become one prosopon. So he's playing with the terminology and stuff uh, to try to kind of alleviate. So anyway, you've got, that's the strand right there is that he's defending Nicaea by having a two subject Christology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then we have Cyril who comes along and he thinks he's going to defend Nicaea from a, the opposite direction. Because then the, the downside of going too far in the two subject thing is it's like, well, then there's really no incarnation, right? There's, yes. or, 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 or it seems like an incarnation light at best. Yes. And like the he, son of God doesn't actually become man because exactly. we have we have this man who seemingly almost just kind of participates, right? In, exactly. in the divine or something like that. Yeah, and has maybe some sort of higher degree of prophetic relation spiritually or with the Holy Spirit right. to 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 the Son, but isn't the Son, isn't the God, mm -hmm. isn't the Father, isn't the Son, isn't spirit, so isn't God. So that's um so yeah, so Cyril and and Cyril also has the right to claim. Uh, that a, an earlier impulse and earlier debates would support his way of thinking and defending Nicaea, because what he would say is, well, wasn't it the very confession of the sort of the impl implicit full divinity of the son who suffered on the cross that even gave rise to the whole Arian controversy that led to Nicaea? Like if, if it was clear from the start that Jesus was definitely not in the same sense God as the father. And of course, as you well know, there's a whole bunch of ambiguity there. So, so he doesn't simply have the whole historical record on his side by any means. Nevertheless, there is a kind of like, why, why, why did we even have a fight then though? If it was so clear that these two were just two different subjects, mm -hmm. like you don't mm -hmm. have a fight about that over Elijah. Yeah. You don't have a fight about that over John the Baptist or anyone, right? Because they're yeah, just, or, or, or a saint that comes after him. Yeah, anything, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so he's saying, no, 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 no. We have to affirm that one and the same, the, he who is eternally generated from the Father and consubstantial with the Father, is the same one who was born of Mary, is the same one who walked around in Palestine, is the same one who walked in the water, who was crucified, etc. Right. So, and 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 you're exactly right that the sufferings, right, the crucifixion becomes the linchpin here, uh, all the way up to Chalcedon, and that's that's where we're headed finally. Uh, uh, it be, because that's the thing that I think everyone can at least admit viscerally seems the least godlike, a weak, yeah. frail, pathetic, you know, person tortured and dead hanging on a tree. And that's exactly why Cyril goes there. And so in his third letter to Nestorius and in the anathemas, he's going to say, you know, anathema be anyone who does not confess that the son suffered. He's the subject. Yes, mm. through the flesh. Yes, through his humanity. But it's his humanity, not anyone else's. So that's his thing. One subject Christology. Two. So that's the huge debate. There's an attempt to kind of bring them together in 431 Ephesus. It's kind of a failure, to be honest. Doesn't do much. So we get to 451 Chalcedon. There's been there's other players that come up. Basically the same problem, the same debate. And basically what Chalcedon does in the so-called the Chal Chalcedonian definition, which is all important for later uh, controversies and Maximus more or less cites here and there. Um, is kind of a sort of <laughs> both andism. Uh, it's a sort of just blanket. And this is why Ronder said it's really just the beginning because it didn't really put an end to anything. It set an agenda, you might say. It set sort of a kind of just... It set boundaries in some sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, it sets up. But boundaries. it's not it's not a clear propositionalized answer. It's sort of a negative, not this, not this, and somewhere in here. Yes. And so exactly. And it throws out some terms that it doesn't really care to say much about how what they mean and how they relate. So here's basically the the, the pattern with, with Chalcedonian definition 451, what they settle on, and it was usually contentious and all that. Basically, it starts off, it, it's bookended by what you might call a serial one subject view. The very, what we declare what the fathers, right? Here we are with that rhetoric again, right? We declare what the fathers have always taught, you know, um, that what, what, that the one in the same Lord Jesus Christ, the son of God is consubstantial with the father, but is also, you know, according to his divinity is consubstantial with us, humanity, according to his, his humanity. And what happens is you go, you, so you get this one subject declaration, one in the same Lord Jesus Christ. That's key. One mm -hmm. in the same, not two, not another, none of that. One in the same person. Which, which they will use at the end, but one in the same Lord, he himself. And then it goes through a series, like I, I call it, I, I used to say sort of a series of dualities though. He is, there's two consubstantial relations though. The same one is consubstantial with the father, but also with us. The same one is born before all ages of the father, eternally generated, but also has been born in these last times of the virgin. Okay. So he's got two births. Two cause he's two two essences. He's fully God, mm -hmm. fully man, and, and it says that first, by the way. Perfect in divinity, perfect in humanity, consubstantial with with uh, us in two in two directions. Birth, two births, right? And so you get this sort of series of three dualities: God and man, consubstantial with the Father, consubstantial with us. Um, you know, uh, uh, born in eternity, born here. Okay, so that looks like a kind of concession to the Nestorian impulse. And that's how it will be uh, interpreted by later opponents of Chalcedon. Right. You right. The, gave the, away. The Oriental Orthodox, like the Egyptians, the uh, who else is in that camp? Is it Armenia and Ethiopia? I think. Yeah. They yeah. will. They will um, go away from the Council of Chalcedon out of communion with the rest of the church, and still are because mm -hmm. they felt like it. It, it betrayed too much of the of two subjectism. Yes, because because then the definition ends with a sort of return, a sort of nod again to the one subject, because it says, and it's strong language. We have to admit, it says that these two that he he came out of, in or actually it doesn't include out of. That was a serial thing, but it says he himself, the one and the same person, is completed, one and the same hypostasy, subsistence, or however you want to. And prosopon, it uses both person. So hypostasis or subsistence, one and the same hypothesis and subs, uh, and person. And he exists in two natures, in his two natures. But he's completed and exists in two natures. So it's very enigmatic, very, he's, you're throwing out, you have distinction now between hypostasis and usia. So that's subsistence and essence. Quickly, I would say a definition for that in case people are wondering. Hypostasis is what we've been calling subject. So it's who. It's the who. And so that's why they also use person as a synonym there. And then the essence or uzia is, or nature, both of those are used synonymously here, is what. So what you yeah. are is human, who you are is Sam, right? And so they're saying one, one who, two what. Um, and that's kind of how it ends. So, so what do we have there? I mean, what's the settlement? Well, there's a dominant sense of a one subject, but then everything else is two. So you, it sort of feels like a fragile harmony here held together to sort of simply juxtapose. And that's the way it's basically taken. So everything after Chalcedon, and it mainly becomes a fight between those who support Chalcedon, that this is the true sort of way. And then those who oppose it and the ones opposing it are almost by and large completely the Miaphysites, the one nature. They think that Chalcedon, as you said, betrayed Cyril, mm -hmm. introduced too much division right down the middle of Jesus, the one person, mm -hmm. and has basically ceded to Nestor Nestorius, which is why they see at every later controversy, you have the Chalcedonians, the, those who defend Chalcedon, advocating two of something, right? Two natures yeah. was first. That was Chalcedon. But then later, and Maximus is now involved in these controversies, now there's two activities of Christ. 
Mm -hmm. to actualizations to living at like motions from these two natures. So there's human and divine and somehow there's two of those and now there's two wills. Right. And, and you go down the line. And so for that, you can see how they would think, look, it seems, looks to me like you just give lip service to there being one person, but everything else about him is two. Yeah. Yeah. And it, so, it's, yeah. yeah, it's just a, it's a union in words only. Right. Exactly. But, right. Mm -hmm. And so, and so that's the kind of, now, so there's this movement that grows up that scholars now for about the past hundred years have called Neo-Chalcedonians, the Neo-Chalcedonianism uh, uh, movement. Um, and basically the Neo-Chalcedonians realize that the Miaphysites, the ones who reject Chalcedon's Christology, uh, do have a point or they have something like a legitimate worry. And so the task for them is that on the one hand, Neo-Chalcedonians, so they're Chalcedonian in the sense they want to support Chalcedon, but they're Neo, they're new, in the sense that they want to develop further some of the just distinctions and terms that were just thrown out there to kind of like yeah. pacify everyone. So the great task of Neo-Chalcedonians, and I think Maximus basically stands at the far end of this, and he himself, I think, I don't think it's even controversial to say he's basically sort of the perfection of it, or you might say the kind of high point. They have to say, they have to try to convince Miaphysites that Chalcedon has not betrayed Cyril and, and that actually the one subject emphasis is still the governing emphasis. And in order to do that, they have to develop further this distinction between hypostasis, subsistence, and uzia, uh, essence. And then, and, and they have to say, first, what, what is the difference? And then secondly, how do those come back together in an actual one real single identity, unity, identity mm -hmm. even, in and as Christ, the one Lord Jesus Christ, um, and, and so in such a way that does meet the kind of concerns of the one subject proponents like uh, like the Miaphysites, like Severus of Antioch, who, who was the, probably the greatest opponent of Chalcedon. So that's... Um, and who is a saint, by the way, in some and a lot of those traditions you named earlier, who broke away from Chalcedon, they see him as a saint. And, you know, mm -hmm. so Maximus is uh, Maximus's position then is that roughly is this. I'll just throw this out there, and then you kind of maybe ask specifics if you want. His position is that there is no such thing as a nature that exists on its own. It's always, in the technical term, is in hypostasized. Mm -hmm. A quick way to do this, it's sort of an Aristotelian point. I mean, there, it's not totally new. It's this idea that there is no, we can abstract and have concepts about things that as such don't exist anywhere. So like humanity, you never run into humanity, <laughs> even though right, you can think right. about humanity, you can abstract, you can, you can have definitions of humanity, but you only ever run into humanity as it's actually instantiated, like in Sam and Gordon. And right. Others. You run into humans. You don't run into humanity. Exactly. And the humans are the who, right? They are the persons, the, the hypostasis, the, the, the subsistences. The, and they're real. They're the reality, the concrete reality. Now, this is where it gets a little. So, so you, Sam, are a person. You are a who. And your name, Sam, sort of points to that. You're not just an instance of humanity, even, although you are also that. You do exemplify what humanity is like, although you, you're simultaneously also always exemplifying that in your own way, Sam's mm -hmm. way. Yeah. And so these are, these are only ever even able to be thought about because they're actually united in one reality, Sam. Now, I could go on and talk about, here's what's really distinctive about Sam. That would be talking about the person. And I can, and I, or I could talk about humanity and never even reference you or anyone else. Humanity mm -hmm. is like this. Human nature is like this. Um, but they only ever exist together and as one. And so Maximus thinks that's significant. This this gets tough and it gets really subtle because here's the real problem. We can thinking about what something is, giving it a category, a name, a label, a definition: tree, cup, human, uh, whatever you know, angel. That's a little bit more intuitive in, in theorizing about things. What is something like? What, is, what kind of thing is it? Taxonomies and all that. But when you go to think about a person, 
what's so difficult about that is on the one hand, the person is real. You, Sam, are real. And in fact, your humanity wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for you. I mean, it is yours. Um, but it's very hard to know how to talk about you. Because every time I go to talk about you, this is a famous problem in logical predication way back in, in you know, early uh, antiquity. Every time you go to talk about a subject, whatever you go on to say will always be more general than the subject itself, himself mm -hmm. or herself. Right. So, so if I say Sam. Sam has some gray hair, right? right? Okay. Well, hair now is this abstraction of yes. these things that are growing out of my head. Gray is a color, right, yes. that, that yes. we can see in general things. So, right, like I'm using these general things to say that Sam has some gray hair. Right. And I'm giving you, and actually it's funny. I always point this out in our grammar, the way we talk, it's built in. We talk, we say, we talk about, about somebody or something mm -hmm. well, that, that means around. Yeah. You're always just getting pictures, side you know, angles around the subject, but the subject him or herself really can't be fully spoken directly, even spoken, or I could say, so you gave example of accidents, right? Hair, gray color and hair. I could, because you know, if you lose your hair, you'll still be Sam, you'll still be human. So they're accidental to you in that sense. Or I could talk about your, your essence, though. I could say Sam is human and Sam, therefore, is rational. <laughs> and, you know, um, mm -hmm. I think you are rational, but um, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully I do my best. <laughs> now, I would be saying Sam has the capacity, you know, I could be really tongue in cheek mm -hmm. and say, well, really, what I mean is that Sam has the potency, the potential to be rational. Now, actually, is he rational? I don't know, but no, I'm just kidding. But, uh, so I'd say, you know, you're human, which means you're bipedal. Um, you know, you you have thoughts, you have memory, you know, and I'm prescending from any obviously difficult cases mm -hmm. and stuff. But anyway, so but everything I say about you, human, rational, hair, gray, whatever, even where you're born, even like, well, he was born in X town, you know, even to these parents, because maybe you have siblings and they also have that. parent. Like everything I say about you is a little bit more general than actually you, the individual, the person. And so why I'm bringing all this up, this sort of phenomenology of speaking about persons, is because it really is important to understand the difficulty at the heart of, of the later Christological controversies. Because what someone like Maximus wants to say is when Chalcedon says that there is one person, Jesus Christ, the one Lord Jesus Christ is one person or hypostasis, it is talking about the who. And he himself is what makes them real. And he himself is what makes them really one thing. Here, Neo-Chalcedonians do an interesting thing with an old analogy. They like to use body and soul. And, the, and, and But Maximus does it in a kind of totally innovative way. I wrote an article about this. He says, um, you know, because it used to be you could use this analogy in two ways. A human being is a body and a soul. And the ones that want to defend one nature of Christ, like the Cerulean defenders, the one subject people, they're going to say, well, that's actually a great example, right? Because you're a human and a, or you're a, you're a, you're a, you're a body and a soul. You have two parts to you, but really they make up one nature. Mm -hmm. And so they think it defends their Christology, the one subject, one nature. Um, but then the other people, <laughs> other more sort of Nestorian two subjects will say, well, but even in the union, even in Sam, even, even, you know, your body and your soul, yes, they are united and they're one nature in some sense, but they still retain their own distinct qualities. Like your mind seems to be invisible, whereas your brain and your body aren't. Mm -hmm. So there's still difference and you can still distinguish. And so let's see, look, Jesus is divine and human. So you can still distinguish the two, even though he's, he's both. What Maximus and neo Chalcedonians will do is they'll take this analogy and say, but actually the real point of comparison isn't the ones people have been making. The more interesting point is you, Sam, the person, you are and sort of, in, as it were, make real your body and your soul. They would not exist as yours apart from you. And you are their real unity. And yet you are a unity or an, their identity in such a way that it doesn't cancel out their essence, their essential difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So actually they can kind of say both sides were right in their own way uh, using this analogy, even though they thought they were opposing each other. So you right. see that the Neo-Chalcedonian project is like a synthesis. It's a, and in fact, that's the word that's used 
that Greek word is used later in the in the councils to defend uh, at 553. It's used to define the hypostatic union according to synthesis. It's an um, attempt to to kind of bridge together what had seemed like irreconcilable positions. Absolutely right. And in fact, that was the earliest way to identify Neo-Calcedonians was by their rhetoric of their willingness to speak both sides at once. Mm -hmm. And even some of them demand that you have to or else you're going to miss out on one of the, a part of the mystery. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of so Maximus's Christology in a nutshell is is that is there is one person is Christ. He has two essences. They are not is they are not, but they're not real in any other way except as him. Just like mm -hmm. your body and soul aren't real and aren't even really one, except as you. And, and the difference would be here that while body and soul kind of are closer to each other on the the scale of essence, as it were, um the for, for Maximus, humanity and divinity considered in their essence really are essentially opposites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is why, so finally we're coming to the kind of back to, this is why he thinks he's being more faithful to Cyril than even the Cyrillian, you know, people. Interesting. Because what he's saying is you don't have to compromise anything like divine impassibility or human passibility or divine eternity or human temporality precisely because when you say those things, you're only speaking about the essence, but you've not even glimpsed and hardly begun to even speak about the only way that they can be one, which is as a person. So that's kind of his, uh, in a nutshell, it's the best I can do maybe yeah. here as to, as a synthesis, a synthesis. Sure. So let's talk a little bit about will, because obviously the, the controversy going on during Max's time was about will and 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 this almost even leads Maximus to even elaborate on the philosophy of will itself in an yeah. in interesting sort of way. So so what does Maximus say about the two wills and how you can have almost like two wills are two sort of activities, but still be united even in that? Yeah. So so yeah, the the, the activities and then the so first of all, I'll just make a point to say. Really, the, the controversy about uh, the wills is a kind of further moment and the bigger controversy about the activities, which are themselves a moment and the bigger controversy about the two yeah, natures. Yeah. And that's because, as we've mentioned already, um, like, let's just give an example again of a human being is if, if they are naturally rational. That means for a lot of philosophers, at least and theologians, at least means that you can desire something and you can have a reason or a goal for desiring it. Mm -hmm. there, there's other things too, but let's just stick with those for now. You have a goal, whether or not you explicitly think about it very hard, and then you can desire to achieve that goal. And so you act with purpose. That's rationally. Um, uh, just consider generally, obviously people can critique mm -hmm. other people and you can critique yourself about whether or not that was the best way or whatever. But in general, that's what it means to be rational. So, that's so by nature you're rational, but that that doesn't really say yet yet anything about what happens when you actually go to to um, to actualize those potentials, those capacities. So that that so now we've moved from what it means to be what kind of being you are to how you are that kind of being and action, actual fact and deeds and choices and and events and so forth. And so here you are not just talking about the faculty of willing rationally, but 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 you're actually talking about, um, you know, uh, the act of doing that. Right. And so that's where the controversy comes in. That sounds really abstract, but actually it's really important because when we're talking in Chalcedon about, well, he has two natures, he's fully God, fully man and all that, that kind of makes sense on a, a theoretical level. At least it's not utterly contradictory, but it really used all the real pressures of contradiction fall when you start to really think about the actual fact, like say the actual life of Jesus. And so now, now, now you've got the Cerulean's, the anti-Chalcedonians saying, well, hold on a second. So let's just grant you that Jesus has two natures, which means he has two kind of capacities, the divine capacity to, to be divine. So that's eternal, creative and all this other stuff. Um, but also he's got the capacity to be human, which includes all these other things like passibility, ignorance, perhaps, or whatever. When Jesus, the one subject, goes to act, what what happens? Are you? I mean, what are mm -hmm. we imagining here? Do we yeah. have two sort of like 
parallel histories or stories just sort of juxtaposed to each other unfolding next to each other parallel or or what because it seems like it has to in actual fact not theoretically anymore but in actual fact in the in the act itself they they need to at least there come together as one right and so that was actually a way in which some people thought that could be a bridge between these two parties maybe we say jesus has two natural uh, two natures, two natural sets of or two sets of natural capacities. But when he goes to act, they become one in activity. So there's one activity, mm-hmm. and you can mm-hmm. even qualify it the way Dionysius does. You could say it's theandric, mm-hmm. it's human mm-hmm. divine. It's sort of this hybrid of the two. But 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 so, and then the wills I think adds a further dimension. You know, Maximus rejects that. He thinks no, no. If there's two natures, there's two activities. But he still senses that's not enough because you still are left with well, what's going on in the actual life of Jesus, the one life of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so what he wants to do with both the activities and then especially the wills, and that adds a that adds what I will call an existential dimension that's even more immediate to us. And obviously, then you go to the garden, the Gethsemane, or something like that. And you say, okay, fine, let's let's even grant for a second that there are two activities that flow from these two natures of Jesus. Okay, but what do you do with the garden where he's sitting there praying, you know, sweating drops of blood? And he says, if you can take this cup from me, please do. But nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. Yeah, so it right. seems like there's a kind of struggle, a division there, a tension, a friction. And so when he wills, which is an activity of rational nature, willing. When he wills, can we at least say there? I mean, it sounds like he's giving up his will and saying, your will will be my will. And so maybe they come together in some, again, kind of hybrid. There's mm-hmm. a, maybe it's a, maybe it's a theandric willing. Maybe it's a God human willing. And, but it's the one person who himself is divine and human. Therefore, what he wills in the actual act of willing must be divine and human and one in actual fact, in the act of willing itself. And that's, again, a sort of, is th- does this work to conciliate the two sides? And again, Maximus, you can see why people want to kill <laughs> yeah. him, right? Stubborn and says, no, 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 no. Because it's still, these are still acts that are natural to div- human and divine. Yeah. It, t- it t- t- takes a little bit of stubbornness to be a confessor. <laughs> Absolutely, right. And yeah, especially because all they're asking him to do basically is to just shut up about it. And he's, he wouldn't yeah. do it. But um, so, <laughs> nevertheless, I think, and this is where I do think the, the scholarship is sort of, it's one of these points I think is kind of, uh, neglected and sort of fallen off the radar a little bit but maximus doesn't simply sit there and say so no that's it it's just two 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 and you got to deal with it because we've already agreed in principle that christ is two natures at calcedon if you're on that side actually i think he is sensing the full weight of the cerulean objection of in actual fact what is one here what is one reality about jesus about his actual life and so his way of doing it you know and people can assess this differently is to say both at the level of natures themselves, actually, but then the activities of those, the actualizations, the actual deeds and events of those natures uh, of the one person, and then including the willing, even in Gethsemane, what you have is what he'll call uh, the perichoresis or the interpenetration of the two. And again, at first, this sounds a little bit like a trick. Obviously, he's taking this from some Trinitarian theology, although Gregory of Nazianzus had spoken this way like twice. Because perichoresis had been used to talk about the three persons of the Trinity being inside yes. each other as yes. a way to kind of help glue or unify the persons of the Trinity into one God. And yes. so he's doing a little bit of that same sort of thing to kind of glue or unify the the natures in Christ. Yes, and if you if you if we really want to get deep into this sort of the the deep undercurrent currents, interestingly in the trinitarian theology, it's kind of in the same for the same reasons for the same pressures, I mean, under the yeah. same pressures, right? Because I can talk about father, son, and spirit. I can even talk about how they sort of relate and I can try to make a case for or against whether or not they're equally the same essence. But, but or the unity seems verbal sometimes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So like, what so, a yes. Gregory of Nyssa, why isn't that three gods? Right. Yeah. And, exactly. And, and, and he writes a whole book, you know, trying to, well, all right, you gotta get these back into one. Yeah. Yes. And interestingly, right, irrelevant here. This is actually another added pressure. One of the main arguments in that book is well, because one essence produces one activity. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so all three persons, while they have a, a proper role, it's not like they have three different activities going on. Yeah. And so look, so transpose that to the Christological controversies that we're talking about. Well, you can see then why some people, monenergists, they were called, they were trying to say, well, hold on. Can we at least say, even if he has two natures? So actually, some of these people were Chalcedonians themselves. So it gets all mixed up here. Yeah, some yeah. of them would say, well, hold on. He, yeah, he has two natures. But again, in actual fact, though, we, does it, don't we need one activity to make it like make a unified something? So that is, it's the same divine activity, right? The same exactly. divine activity in the Trinity is the divine activity in, in the Son of God, you know, our Lord Jesus Exactly, because these things are all stitched together, right? We have to have a continuum mm. here. And so it is pretty, it's a pretty, you know, kind of wild thing. Or, or from one perspective, it's a kind of um, interesting thing that Maximus resists that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And instead goes to a different part of Trinitarian theology and says, well, but actually, let me just say this explicitly, I'll think you piece it together. Um, actually, the way the, the actual life of the Trinity isn't simply mirrored on or mir a mirror image of or, or an imposition of the way we abstract about the Trinity. In fact, the whole father is in the whole son and the whole son is in the whole spirit and the whole spirit is in the whole, right? All that. That's perigresis, mm -hmm. like you said. And so in act, like you might say the existential dimension or reality of the Trinity, while it does preserve the personal distinction between the three and even perhaps with Gregor Nyssa, the, 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 the proper roles each plays in the one divine activity, nevertheless, the existential character, like the contours, as it will, of the divine life is perichoresis. And mm -hmm. so what Maximus does, and he actually does explicitly in Ambiguum 5, he calls this the Lord's mode of being. Because he himself is already perichoretically indwelled by the Father and Spirit, and that's what it means to be God under that picture, then when he is incarnate, he brings that same mode in and as his humanity. So that his humanity is divinity now, which is, this is where it becomes unthinkable, where the incarnation becomes really a kind of revelation, a mystery. Now in himself, he unites what vertically seems to be totally distinct and, in fact, absolutely opposite or extreme, uh, different, mm -hmm. you know, extremes between God and man. He, he even in himself, in his person, he brings his own mode of being person, intertrinitarian mode of being person, which is perichoresis, into his nature so that they are now interpenetrating whole and whole and in the actions whole and whole. So he goes to, for example, walking on water, Right. Some people might say, oh, well, well, you know, when he walks, that's a human thing. Mm -hmm. That's a human activity. But the fact that it's on water is a divine thing because it's a miracle. OK, but 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 Maximus wants to draw your attention to the bigger picture. The synth the synthesis, the unity here is actually that both activities are only the activity of one subject, which means they're both simultaneous and they're penetrating in the same event. Yeah. So now we have an event whose contours are the perichoresis of acts or activities in Christ. So that, and I know this sounds bizarre to say, I mean, a lot of this has already probably sounded bizarre, but it sounds bizarre to say that in this sense, an event in the life of Jesus is not simply the sum total of his activities, divine and human. That would be the more intuitive way maybe to think of it. It's actually their, their paradoxical interpenetration the fact that they remain two natural, naturally distinct activities, but in and as and only as the result of one person's agency or action. Mm -hmm. And so that's so that's making hor on so this is the last way I'll say it. It's making on the horizontal level, as it were, through time and space, the human the level of human existence we typically think of, it's making that mode the same as what's true vertically up there in the Trinity between Father, Son, and Spirit. It's like they're weaving together, you know, from sort of two uh, high and low angles into sort of a kind of, uh, you might say, a spiral or a sort of interweaving a tapestry of the divine and the human through all, all of history, you know, starting from the life of Christ. So that's, so he's bringing the mode, the intra-Trinitarian mode of being, the perichoresis of Father, Son, and Spirit as the unity, as the oneness of God himself. And saying that even now is made the mode of being of humanity and divinity in the one person who's come down is incarnate, which is why ultimately for Maximus, our deification, 
mm-hmm. is is literally the other side of the coin, the other sort of side of the activity of the God man, the incarnate man, because right. he became human and made that now the mode of being human to interpenetrate God. We can, though we're born human, become God, etc. So, yeah. Yeah, man, I, we only I only have like a couple minutes, but there are like <laughs> two huge subjects that I also wanted to talk to you about that we didn't even get to, which I suppose means we might just need to talk again. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, I, I mean, the, I'll, I'll just throw them out here, maybe as a teaser, an invitation for further um, conversation is talking about creation in Maximus, right? Yeah. And and his sort of very Christo or crucis centric, I guess I could say, view yeah. of creation which is interestingly something that my tradition also really emphasized huh. is that like the verses in the new Testament where it talks about Jesus creating, like, um, I don't know, all things were made through him and by him and for him. Right. That's like in Colossians, but there, you know, John one, uh, Hebrews one, you know, a couple other sort of Jesus creating passages. And we would always say that was the new creation that was made through Jesus on the cross and in his resurrection. Or something like that, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I, and and then I was like, oh well, Maximus has a very similar idea to that. That's, yes, that's interesting. And then t- trying to figure out what I like about Maximus and what I can agree with, it, but what I can't quite agree with either, mm-hmm, a- mm-hmm. and sort of feeling that out. And because basically, my theology is basically instead of God became man so that man might become God, which is sort of that theosis idea you were talking about. Mine's sort of like. Jesus achieved theosis so that we can achieve theosis, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and trying to kind of nail down where exactly the difference is between that and an incarnational, essentially divine Jesus, as opposed to just a participatively divine Jesus would right. be and what some of the ramifications of that. But unfortunately, I, I've got a, I've got, I don't know, a job in <laughs> a meeting that I need to go to. So <laughs> but anyway, I'll, I'll say a, any last things you want to say before we close out? Well, I just I'll I'll only comment on that first little part because I do I can, can stitch up our conversation. I think you know I think maybe some people if they've made it this far might be like you know especially that last rant I just went on. Uh, you know this is just like where are we? It's stratospheric. I mean we we've we are just like you're talking about Perry Greece you're talking about modes, natures, activities, blah blah blah. And granted, there's no there's no denying it. it you've read Maximus, I think Sam. Like he's complicated. I mean he's got a reputation for that. I mean even in the Eastern tradition that adores him as a saint you know Mm -hmm. so there's no question about it it's very sophisticated it can get very heady however the very fact that you said and this is the other conviction i do have about maximus is theology and again it doesn't mean you can't disagree with it or anything but the very fact that you said you know some of those ideas that seem more wild and like like extreme were actually ones that we sort of had even in my tradition and kind of it's just sort of from reading the new testament in a kind of certain clear-eyed way in some passages right Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. maybe people gloss over that's the last sort of plea I'll make on behalf of Maximus's theology and why stick with it a little bit, at least to try to understand it. Is at the end of the day, what really, what really, um, uh, I guess, invigorates me most about his thought, or one of the things that invigorates me most, is that I go back to the New Testament. I go back to Scripture and with some of this stuff, and I and, and, and it's just amazing how many times where I'm like, oh, it makes it pop it, with an it, extra sense, and yeah. it's just sitting there the whole time. It's mm-hmm, just sitting there mm-hmm. the whole time, you know, the perichoresis thing, yes. really, you could, you could compare Col- Colossians one and three and you get the almost exact same uh, uh, pattern of thought. So anyway, I'll just say that, that that's awesome to hear. It doesn't surprise me, but yeah, we should, we should, we should continue to drill down and, and see what yeah. we get. All right. Well, unfortunately I got to go, but Jordan, I really appreciate this conversation. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and hopefully we can talk again sometime. Sounds good. Thank you, Sam, for the invite. All right. Uh, Thanks, everyone, for listening.